Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Sunday worship here at Northminster United Church in Calgary. Today is Sunday, June 6th, 2021. It is good that we can join our hearts and minds and spirits together from near and far in this way. An especially warm welcome to those who may be worshiping with us for even the first time. Um, those who may be connecting after a time apart, it is good we can be here and host each other and be together in this way. Our Christ candle is lit. There once was uh, someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people followed him. And they wanted to know who he was. And so they asked him, and he said to them, I am the light of the world. So our Christ candle is lit in symbol, in recognition, in memory, in celebration of that one. We also pause in a moment of gratitude, giving thanks that we are privileged to be here on Treaty 7 land. We give thanks for all who have cared and continue to care for this land. Let's now pause deeply and breathe deeply and focus our hearts and our minds on this time of worship. Is it morning, really morning, or is it just another day, a, a new beginning, or is it just a continuation of yesterday? May we greet each other as gift and blessing. May we fold its promise of this day into who we will become and live to the fullness of what teachings might exist. New thoughts, new ideas, new potentials, new promises. Let us now be still and know that all will be well. That in all manner of things it will be well. Our journey this morning continues with Lewis and Clark. Last week, we learned how these early explorers in the early 1800s were confronted with the Rocky Mountains as they were seeking a western or a water trade route western to the west through to the Pacific Ocean. They had their worn and trusty canoes with them, but those Rocky Mountains, well, as you might imagine, it would not get them over such vast new terrain. They needed, Lewis and Clark needed to find a way through this new wilderness. There wasn't one short, simple route from A to B. Nor was it simple and a direct route for Moses through his wilderness as we'll hear today. Nor is our journey simple and short for us most of the time. Questions linger. Deep emotions in the wilderness are felt. Fresh anticipation percolates as this community gathers in this sacred place as we give thanks for the past and still look to the future. So draw in your deepest breath, knowing that you are welcomed and valued now and here. And be at peace and at one with yourself and with one with those who may be near or those far. Let us affirm on this journey in this wilderness, wherever we may be going, whatever direction, that we are not alone. That we need others and others need us to be more of who we are, to be challenged to new growth, to be fully alive. Let's pray. God of creation, your extravagant love has called us together. Long before we even knew you, you already knew us and had chosen us to be part of your own family, sisters and brothers with Jesus Christ himself. 
What amazing love, God, you have shown toward us. And so we gather in this time with praise and thanks, offering you the worship of our hearts and our lives and opening ourselves to the prompting and the leading of your Holy Spirit. Receive our worship, our praise, our prayers, our offerings. May the time we spend here in your presence assure us, renew us, focus us on your presence throughout our lives. That it will strengthen in us the courage we need to face each day, each path, each wilderness, each opportunity you create for us. Amen. Let's now sing together our opening hymn. It's a song of praise to the maker. So today we are continuing the story of Moses helping lead the Hebrew people, the Israelites, out of their slavery in Egypt where they'd been for 400 years and back um, into the land they had come from but toward this place called the promised land, the place that God had intended for them to be in. And so, so here we are now. Last week we heard about the, um, the, that group of folks, the Hebrew people, um, leaving Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. The sea was parted for them and they went through and now here they are. So now they're in the wilderness. And now, now if I was... 
think if I was going somewhere I'd never been before, and it was a long journey, I would get out my phone and turn on my Google Maps, and I'd put in the address I wanted to go to, and up would come all of these options of routes for me. Usually, the most direct route is on my, my phone, or it's the route with no highways, or, you know, there's different options it gives me. I will always, almost always pick the shortest route to get to when I want to go somewhere, right? Now, you think God would have done the same thing. You think that because the wilderness was a difficult, uncomfortable, maybe dangerous even place to be at times, that God would say, okay, here's the wilderness. You need to go to B and you're at A and we're going to take the shortest route as possible to get you where you need to go, right? But the story actually says that God chose not to take the shortest route. Exodus 13, it says God didn't lead them through the shorter route. God led them by the roundabout way. So Craig's going to put up a picture for us. This is a map of the journey that those folks went on in our story. If you look on the very, the very left side, so the west side of the map, you will see where Egypt is, right? You see the Mediterranean at the top corner, top left corner, and Egypt's right below it on the, the left side of that map. And on the right side of the map, also toward the top then, is the promised land. So if I was going to pick the shortest route on my map, you would see they would just go from Egypt straight across at the top of that map to the promised land. But it says God didn't take them that route. Instead, so you can even see the long red line on the bottom where they actually went all the way down to the bottom of the map and all the way back up. Even Mount Sinai is down at the bottom, which is where the story of the Ten Commandments happens. So thanks, Craig. You can take that, that map off. Um, I want you to imagine now that that map is your hand. So take your hand and hold it up. And over here where your thumb is, is where Egypt was, right? And over here on this side where your pinky is, is where the promised land is. And how it would have been so easy for God to just walk, God with Moses and all the people to just walk together straight across the map, the shortest route possible to the promised land. That would have been the easiest way. That would have been what Google would have said, right? But that's the way the Philistines went. So you think, oh, some have gone that route already. We could go that route too. But God knew they couldn't go that way. They weren't quite ready for that kind of route yet. There was too many challenges to go the shortest route. And so God took them from here, from Egypt, all the way down to the bottom of the map, and then all the way back up. And that was a much longer route to go, almost like going in circles a little bit on the map. God did that on purpose, that circling round, that roundabout way because God knew they weren't ready to tackle the challenges that the new place had for them. We all want new things, don't we? And we all want to be able to move to that next thing right away, that new place, just quick. We want to get there. But sometimes we aren't quite ready to do that. Scripture says the Hebrews weren't quite ready either. That sometimes God has to do a new thing in us, before God can do a new thing with us. I love that, that God has to do a new thing in us before God can do a new thing with us. So let's pray, just to reflect on that story together and before we go into the rest of our worship, let's pray. God of the journey, God of the wilderness, God of the destination, we thank you for the paths that you guide us on sometimes short and direct routes, as well as the roundabout ways. Help us to be present in those times, to explore our purpose and our calling as we circle around until the, direct, the direction that you have promised for us is more clear. For patience and openness and courage in the wilderness times, we pray. Amen. This morning's reading for June the 6th is taken from Exodus chapter 13 and then chapters 17 to 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, 
God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sudoth, they camped at Edom on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of clouds to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Welcome. This is part two of our four-week sermon series about canoeing the mountains. And it's based on a couple of books that I've been reading this year that have been recommended by colleagues and the Edge Network and um, other, other folks in the United Church and beyond who are looking at how churches can look to the future and and what are ways we can do that most effectively and what our experiences are when we finally take those steps and make that journey together. So the Canoeing the Mountains book, which uh, this title has come from, is written by Todd Bolsinger, excellent read. And the other book, which um, I heard the author speak this spring, is Matt Miofsky, and his book is Let Go. And I need to recognize Matt Miofsky and a lot of his ideas and words that are part of this sermon series. Um, So think about it, if you have ever had a new job before, some people, you you start a job and you end up being able to do it your whole career life, others change jobs quite a bit, and that's increasingly more so with younger generations than past generations. Um, But think of it if if you've had that experience of of having a uh, a new job. It's often part of people's lives. And it's something that's likely quite relatable, and it's sometimes a change that we often uh, contemplate in life. And no, I am not thinking about a job change, but if I was going to do that, I would probably try to keep my current job until I had a new one, or while I look for a new one, right? So while you're still in a comfortable spot, maintaining a current position, you might still apply here and there, or you might have an interview, or meet the boss, or take time to consider the pay, and the commuting, and the benefits, and the what would the disadvantages be of a new position. And then finally, you know, if everything was lined up just perfectly, and you had a finally a really solid plan in place, then you might decide to give notice or maybe take a short vacation in between and find time to move and start the new job seamlessly, right? Perfect planning, of course. (laughs) But that's not a lot how change works, is it? We often get caught instead in that in-between because change suddenly happens without our asking for it, and it isn't always welcomed, and we don't often know how things will turn out, and we can't see the end yet, and yet we have to leave behind what we had before, and so then suddenly we're in this this in-between space, and it can be really terrifying. And as lonely or um, disorienting as it feels, it might still be an important part of the journey. And scripture has a name for that in between. Scripture calls it the wilderness or the desert. Last week we we talked about leaving Egypt, making that choice, and that place between uncertainty and promise to what the comforts of the Hebrew people were leaving behind. 
Today, we are talking about navigating the wilderness. So it would have been nice, like I said, in our conversation time to just walk straight across the top of the map, right to the promised land, right out of the Red Sea. And that would have been just such perfect planning, right? But the story, as I mentioned, actually says that God chose not to take them on the short route. Instead of going straight across that wilderness, God took them out of Egypt and they went the long way, circling in the wilderness with them. There's this idea that God has to turn us into new people before God can take us into a new place. Interesting idea. That, that's this is what Matt Miofsky says, that God has to turn us into new people before God can take us into a new place. We have to log some wilderness time. That in-between space, though, is not wasted time. Doesn't that feel like it sometimes when we're going in circles or things take longer than we thought? It feels like it's just wasted time, but maybe it's not. It's instead this really important feature in what God is leading us on, that it's an intentional part of the journey. That we have to navigate the wilderness, that there will be or is uncertainty. And yes, in all of that, we will be afraid we're going to make mistakes or that something won't turn out the way we wanted. And our temptation in that is to want to just turn around and give up and just go back. For the Israelites, the Hebrew people, they had this rhythm. They had this routine in Egypt where, where they would sleep, what they would eat, that life was predictable. It wasn't easy, but they knew what they would do the next day when they got out of bed. But all of a sudden, in the wilderness, this primary feature is uncertainty. They didn't know where they were going or, or what their next meal would be. And soon, as soon as uncertainty crops up, then they start questioning themselves, right? We all do that. Something we're not sure of. Did we make the right decision or not? And we, we second guess ourselves. And they wonder if they'd made a mistake. And suddenly we wonder, same thing, are we making mistakes? This is exactly what happens with us, just like it did for the Israelites. It sounds so familiar. This happens in life with job changes, relationship changes, moving, any decision we make. It is so evident as well in our congregation right now as we consider redevelopment or, or moving or planning for the future and what direction is it taking, right? We, we, we know we want to and we still don't know quite what that promised land looks like, and we're in this wilderness time, and suddenly we're second-guessing ourselves, and we say, do we want to just turn back? Let's just take a pause. <laughs> There's new ideas cropping up. There's uncertainty no matter what direction or possible decision might be. It feels a bit like we're going in circles, right? We're taking a longer route, but maybe we should have taken the shorter route, right? All those, all those things are just so key for us right now. But this text suggests to us that this is God leading us through it all. And that idea, again, that God has to turn us into new people before God can take us into a new place. And so here we are in the wilderness. Exodus, the story doesn't just happen in Exodus, it goes into the book of Numbers, and if we look ahead a bit to Numbers 11, chapter 4, it talks about the riffraff among us. I love that word, the riffraff. <laughs> Who knew that that word was in the Bible? But it is. If you go to Bible Gateway and look through some of the translations, riffraff is a term used. Others say the rabbles, the rabbles among us. But it says that the riffraff were complaining. Who will give us meat to eat? Where will our water come from? What are we about? And they start remembering all the food and the comforts they had in Egypt. And now they say we're wasting away and there's only manna in front of us. So there's lots of frustrations and, and concerns being voiced in that text. Now all of this, very relatable to our journey, makes reference to a few things. The complaining in the wilderness, because there was uncertainty, and it was something they'd never faced before. And so when fear crops up, they, they turn around and they look in their rearview mirror, they look back to Egypt, and they have this distorted view, right? The objects look different in the mirror, don't they? 
They, they forgot about the slavery and the hot sun or the whips or the long work days or that they had no freedom. They forgot all that. They even forgot that they had prayed for 400 years to be released from all of that. They only remembered the food. They start to have selected memory. All of a sudden, Egypt wasn't so bad, and they question this new direction God is taking them on, and they get really, they get nostalgic. You know about nostalgia. We all do that. What nostalgia does, though, is it distorts our memory of the past. It makes the past look better than it really was. We do this all the time when we are nervous about the present or we're questioning what we're doing or we're missing something or grieving something or we're fearful of what's happening or what might happen. We get nostalgic. It's like a breakup, the end of a relationship. You know, the relationship wasn't great for a while, whatever the reason. And so you end things and you eventually leave but then time goes on and you haven't found anyone new and you start thinking back to that relationship and you, re you remember the good times because you're nostalgic and you start to forget about why you broke up. And eventually you start sending a late night text. That's what the Hebrews were doing. Those late night texts, looking back instead of looking forward. The nostalgia was creating this unrealistic filter of what they were remembering. In the wilderness, we are always wondering if we should go back. Does that sound familiar in your own wilderness times or in this church wilderness time? Are we suddenly questioning if we're heading the right direction? But scripture says God has brought us here, this direction, for a reason. The wilderness in its uncertainty is a big part of the journey. This wilderness helps us clarify our purpose. What is it that we really want to give time to? Whether it's in our own lives, it could be job loss or the death of a loved one, divorce. Places like that in our lives cause us to ask really big questions questions of clarification about our lives and clarifying is painful right but we can suddenly ask big questions about who we are and what we value and where we want to be Israel the Israelites they had to ask that and so do we not slaves any longer but what do we want to be the wilderness journey helps us to develop and mature. It's the, it's, the, it's the very thing we're in right now. Wilderness is a time for us to develop and mature. God didn't take the Israelites straight into the promised land, so God wanted to mold them in the wilderness. In tough times, indeed, we learn a lot, like who our friends are or how we need to be our most authentic selves. We learn lessons whether we choose it or not. In the wilderness, we learn we can't, that we can't learn in our comfort zones. God can teach us a lot when we are out of our comfort zone, away from Egypt. It isn't wasted time and space, and a lot happens in the wilderness. The wilderness helps us rely more on God and less on ourselves. Walk by faith, not by sight, right? The Israelites didn't know where they were going. Moses kind of didn't either. So they follow God as a pillar of cloud by day, as, as fire by night. It's important to do this instead of relying on ourselves, finding new, new ways, new insights, new symbols of what God is and where God might be leading us. That's what faith is, forced to rely more on God and less on ourselves. When we seek to make a change in our lives by force or by choice, whether either way, however change comes about, when we are suddenly out of our comfort zone and into the uncertainty and everything you, everything in you is going to make you want to run back to that familiarity. But scripture is saying, don't do that. 
as hard and frustrating and disorienting as that is, God is wanting you there. God is preparing you for something great, and God has not abandoned you, no matter what you may be feeling in this wilderness. Israel is the Israelites felt like they were circling over and over on that map, but the whole time God was working under the surface in them, preparing them for what was next. So if you ever feel like you're stuck in a holding pattern in those circles, you feel like you're wasting time, never think of it as wasted journey. God is perhaps preparing you for the next leg of the journey. Like the scripture from Romans 26 says, God is never abandoning us, but we are being used by God. So to end the sermon time, let's just listen to these words from Romans. I encourage you to listen to them prayerfully, reflectively, as we um, consider and remember the value of this wilderness time we are in and what we might be called to next. So it's from Romans chapter 8, and there's a few verses, 26 to 28 and 38 and 39. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. And the one who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to God's purpose. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's now sing together our next hymn that the Strathies are leading for us.
for our prayers of the people, I would invite you to share the prayers that are on your mind, in your heart today. So please do type them into the comment section of the Facebook feed there so we can share them with one another today. Let's pray. You, O oh God, love us from the moment of our conception. You know us, you love us in the womb. You love us and you call us from before the moment of our first breath. And you love us when we first see the light of day. As a parent loves a child even before they see it and then embraces it gently from the moment of birth, so you love us and we give thanks. You love us, God, from the time of our naming. You love us in our growing and holding us as we take our first steps. You love us and walk beside us as we explore the world with eager hands and eyes and as we grow and develop. Help us, dear God, to love one another in this way. You love us, God, as we mature and seek our way. You love us as we become aware of the world around us. You love us as we smile and play. You love us when we say no and when we lose our sense of direction. Help us, dear God, to love one another in this way. In our prayers this morning, I see a prayer of congratulations to Dawn and Jane Borbridge who are celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary this week on June 9th. Um, indeed, Lori, may they have many more healthy, happy years together. Congratulations, John, uh, Dawn and Jane. A lot has been in our news this week since the discovery of the children um, at the residential school in Calgary. And my prayer as we continue the unfolding of that story is that we will um, use this information um, that we will, in our prayers, um, consider our own role in the past as a denomination and as we go into the future of how we might work more deeply in and toward truth and reconciliation. I also, um, as someone has already named um, earlier this morning, um, that we hold in prayer the Haydu family um, as Winona passed away a week ago today. And Winona's service um, will be here tomorrow morning at 10.30. It is a small private service just for family, but you are all invited to watch here on Facebook Live at 10.30 as we um, remember and give thanks for Winona. And I see just another prayer from Brad, prayers for everyone at home and hopeful for vaccinations and also being able to be together and in public again. God, God, you hear our prayers. Prayers of love this day for those around us, for those we've held be before you in our time of sharing, and for those we have thought of and held in our hearts in this time and in these moments of caring. Let's gather these prayers together and join our voices in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
our offering, a time of gratitude, a time of giving thanks for the ways God is at work in our world, and our offering is a symbol of that gratitude, and our giving back a portion in hope for what is possible in our shared ministry together with God and into the future. So thank you for the ways that you continue to support Northminster and support God's love being more fully known in the world and the many ways that you make sure your financial gifts still get to church. Let's pray to bless these financial gifts and the many ways we express our faith in our lives. Let's pray. Holy God, may a good feeling be found in our hearts as these gifts are used in partnership with you to help free people from hunger, to lift people from distress, to encourage people to be part of a better world. May our offerings and the gifts of our life guide people from wilderness to promised land with you by their side. Amen. A few announcements this morning. Of course, take time to read all of the announcements in the weekly Friday email. Maybe even give someone a call who you know might not get the emails and share with them. Be, um, be an agent, a messenger of good news and tell them what's happening at the church. Thank you if you're able to do that. We have coffee today after church, as usual, on Zoom. If you don't have the link, message me, email me, phone me, and I will make sure you have it. So we can drop in between 11.30 and 12 for conversation. An event coming up on June 17th, this is in partnership with our Affirming Ministries Committee and the Beer with God group. So they've joined together and are inviting the whole congregation, young and old, men, women, everybody, to please come to this um, guest speaker night on the ABCs of LGBTQ+. Because we all struggle at times to even say the letters. And sometimes we say, now what do those letters even mean? And so it's a great information night with guest speaker Kieran McKee who will be walking us through some of those questions that we have around all the letters and what they mean and what they represent. So, Because knowledge, knowledge is really important for us. And so I invite you all to come to that on Thursday night, the 17th. Sign up at the office for the Zoom link for that. And thanks to those groups for hosting us on that evening. And then you can go one Thursday further to the 24th for our Supper for the Soul. And we are so excited that we have guest speaker Ken Lee Macuelo joining us. You might remember Ken from his CBC radio days here in Calgary. He is now the VP for Marketing and Community Engagement for the Calgary YMCA. And he's joining us. And he's also a singer for the Hebe Jeebies. Now, I don't think Ken's going to sing for us that night, but he has a strong passion for community engagement and resiliency and, and, and how community has such value for all of us and, and the ways we can connect. So looking forward to the 24th when we can hear Ken um, on, that, on that evening together. Um, we have been advertising for our Truth and Reconciliation events. I don't have a slide for this, but um, we were to have Cree classes last week and on the 15th, and we had rescheduled to this Tuesday, but Ernie Poundmaker has had a death in his family, and he's an elder of his community, and, and he is with his family right now and just isn't able to host those Cree lessons for us. So we have had to actually cancel now the Cree lessons for the 8th and the 15th. So we apologize, but we certainly understand and we hold Ernie and his family, Ernie Poundmaker and his family in prayers. And we'll look forward to rescheduling that at a later date. So for those, those announcements and so many more, again, um, take a look at our Friday emails. And we have our blessing to end our time of worship together. Just as God called Moses so long ago, so God calls each one of us to speak and act on God's behalf in the world today. So through the wilderness we go, discerning the path forward. Walk well on your journey. May you be wrapped in the shawl of God's loving, and may you know you are cherished, and may you know you are blessed. 
Amen. Thank you for being here for worship together here today. We will see you again soon, and we'll now go out singing together, Spirit God, Be Our Breath. Bye for now.